Oftentimes, a member of the Catholic Church will be approached by someone who is not Catholic and say, how can you believe in something like the Immaculate Conception when there's no scriptural evidence for this? Well, not only is there scripture evidence, but we also have to understand how scripture is part of the fullness of divine revelation for the fullness of the Catholic Church. Hello and welcome to MaryCast. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli, Professor of Theology and Mariology at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. And again, I'm thrilled to talk about Our Lady and especially these elements that really call for her defense because indeed, they're true. They're revealed as true. And the better we can understand it, the better we can articulate the truth of the Church and defend Our Lady, defend Our Mother, defend the Mother of Jesus and the spiritual Mother of all peoples. Now, when we're talking about the Immaculate Conception and the scriptural evidence for the Immaculate Conception, we have to remember that it is not necessary for a doctrine, a truth to be, real, to be revealed explicitly in sacred scripture. It suffices that it be revealed implicitly. Uh, and let me give you an example. Uh, we've used this earlier in the series, but it's, it's appropriate now to bring up, and that is the example of a pregnant woman. Let's say a couple get married by God's grace, and also by God's grace they conceive on the wedding night. Now, for the first month or so, uh, the woman isn't even necessarily sure that she's pregnant, uh, depending on timing of cycles. Uh, clearly, the husband doesn't know uh, for that period of time. And then after they know, the rest of the world doesn't know except for people they want to be told because the woman doesn't show, especially as a, as a first child and a first pregnancy. It may be three or four months before uh, there's the witnessing of the fact that the woman is pregnant. Well, then gradually the woman shows more and then ultimately, of course, the woman gives birth. Now, we know that that person in the womb is a person from the moment of conception, but we become more aware of the truth of that over time and then eventually when the child is given in birth. That same analogy holds true about doctrines in Scripture. There can be a passage that's pregnant. The truth can be there, but we may not notice it. We may not pick it up. We may not be made aware of it uh, until later in the development. And that's what happens with things like the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. These passages we're going to talk about, Genesis 3.15, Luke 1.20, they're pregnant. The, the doctrine is present, but it takes time for the church and the world to realize what's in that womb of Scripture, what's in the womb of that passage, so that eventually the doctrine comes forward and ultimately, in the case of the Immaculate Conception, it becomes a dogma, a solemnly defined truth. So, let's go to those two pregnant passages. First of all, Genesis 3.15. This is called the, uh, the greatest Old Testament prophecy in the what's called the Proto-Evangelium, uh, the first gospel. This is Genesis 3.15, and I want to read you the passage and keep in context now that God is addressing the serpent. And God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now we're going to talk about the pronoun we're going to say here, she shall crush your head and you shall lie in wait for her heel. Now, I'm going to also insert he and his here. We're going to talk about why. Uh, he shall crush your head and you shall lie in wait for his heel. Let's identify the members of the pericope here, the, the, the passage. Uh, obviously, we have... Satan as the serpent. We have Jesus as the seed of victory. Every Christian has to grant that the seed of victory over Satan and sin is Jesus Christ. Now, if that is in fact true, if Jesus is the seed, then the woman must ultimately be Mary. Eve didn't give birth to the Savior. Uh, only one woman gave birth to the Savior, and that's the Immaculate Mother of God. But here, let's also talk about the relationship between the woman and the serpent. God the Father directly puts enmity between the woman 
and the serpent and their two seeds. What is enmity? Enmity is absolute, total, radical opposition. In some passages of the Old Testament, the word enmity is used for murder, for such a hatred it's hard to describe. But in this case, we're talking about absolute antithetical opposition here, that, that they are absolutely opposed one to the other. And note the same opposition that God puts between the woman and the serpent is the opposition that God has between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. So you're talking about a parallel. Woman, serpent, seed, seed. Those seeds, the seed, Jesus Christ versus the seed of sin. And, and what's the seed of Satan? Sin. All evil humans, all evil angels. That parallel is present so that you cannot say that Mary is any closer to the serpent than Jesus is closer to sin. In other words, it's a parallel structural way of saying that what separates Jesus from sin is also what separates the woman from the serpent. Now, indeed, the woman has to be married. And let's get to the, to the reality of the Immaculate Conception. We're going to come back to the pronoun in just a moment. Why does Pius IX uh, claim this as really the foundational text for the Immaculate Conception. Because indeed, because of that opposition. Because if in fact the woman has the same opposition to Satan as her seed does to sin, well we know that Jesus' opposition to sin is absolute. He's God. He's the God-man. Uh, he cannot have any participation in sin, obviously. But Mary has that same parallel opposition against Satan that Jesus has against sin. So she cannot be with Satan any more than Jesus can be with sin. And that's why this is the foundation of her freedom from original sin. She can't dabble into the enemy's camp. She can't be a double agent. Uh, do you think God the Father would say, look, I want this woman to participate with the God-man in the redemption of the human race, and then say, but you know what? I think it's okay that uh, she has a, a, an allegiance, she has a loyalty to the enemy. It wouldn't even make logical sense, let alone supernatural and divine sense. So this is the en enmity, the absolute opposition. And notice with the pronoun, uh, I think we're going to find in the Latin, it was ipsa uh, for 15 centuries. Many papal documents of the 19th and 20th century talk about Mary as she will crush the head. It's, it's a reference to Our Lady. In private revelation approved by the church, like the miraculous medal, it's very clear that Our Lady is crushing the head of Satan. So the new translation in the Hebrew, he and she is interchangeably used. It can be translated either way in different times. In the Greek, it's, it's he. In the new Latin Vulgate, it's neuter. It's, uh, so we're not clear whether it's he or she. And I think what we're going to find in the passage, because it starts as a discussion between the woman and the serpent, right? That's, those are our protagonists and antagonists. Those are our antecedents. That the pronoun would rightly make reference back to them. She will crush his head. Now, she crushes his head because she's in perfect conformity with Jesus. She has that same opposition. So her immaculate conception makes her the co-redemptrix, you see. Her opposition from sin makes her the perfect person to crush the head of Satan, which she does by the power of Jesus. We're going to get into the second gem, the second pregnant passage of the Immaculate Conception shortly. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli with MaryCast. God bless you.